everybody for coming. I want to I want to thank pals mainly. I mean, thank you for participating, for wanting to to be advocates, and and really this take some control of the situation by advocacy. That's really, uh, you know, you inspire us. I, I don't even, you know, know what else to say. I think all of us uh, feel that way. The faculty, I want to thank the faculty. Really appreciate everybody participating over the last two days. Uh, you know, made a huge difference. And I know that we've gotten a lot. As faculty, we get so much back. This, this is, you know, we wouldn't want to be any anywhere else. And of course, I, I have to thank the team, uh, my team at the uh, foundation, uh, the our co-ops, uh, Mary, uh, Noah. They've done a, a great job. And of course, Sarah, uh, the two Sarahs, uh, Sarah Addicts, and thank you, Sarah, for actually saving us all the money on a, a company to do this Zoom, <laughs> and. Uh, Sarah Feldman, who helped to put together the booklets that you all have. And of course, Jamie, uh, who's lightened the load. Jamie uh, is, is my MC. So, you know, I, I don't want to have that not be said before, before we leave as everybody sort of runs off the rest of the day after our sort of closing round table. And of course, Dr. Elman is going to run our round table and it's really an opportunity to just go around and talk about, you know, how you feel about anything you want, actually, but how you felt about the last two days. If if you have some ideas, how you're going to use what what you've heard, and we can take it from there. Everything's fair game during this roundtable. Lauren, thank you very much for joining us today, and why don't you go ahead and take the reins? So um, let me just start by um, saying thank you to Terry, Dr. Hyman Patterson for organizing this event, which I think is incredibly important and valuable. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry I wasn't here yesterday. I was doing, I was had other um, commitments, but um, it's been a pleasure to be here today with all of you. Um, and again, thank you, um, Terry, for organizing this. And I hope to be part of these events going forward. Um, we as the you know, ALS physician community value incredibly our partnership with um, the patient and advocate community. And I hope you um, under, know that, understand that and can feel that um, through events like today. Um, I look forward to working with you and I'm happy to make my um, contact information available for anyone who might wanna contact me in the future with any questions. Um, or ideas, uh, et cetera. Um, so just like um, uh, Dr. Hyman Patterson said, um, anything is fair game at this point. So um, if anybody wants to start us off about ideas for advocacy or how they think they'd like to take the information they've heard about today forward, um, please go ahead. I'll stop there for a second and see if anyone wants to jump in. And if not, I'll, I'll get us started. I can start just because I have some pre pre planned ideas. Um, oh, great. Uh, so I'm. Can you guys hear me? Yesterday there yes. was a problem with the mic. Okay. So um, one of the things we're really pushing for, we have going out our campaign for all of 2021 is drugs and bodies, um, as I mentioned when we were talking initially. So in that capacity, we're pushing very very hard for the Act for ALS. Um, this week, the helpmyuri.com app, Deb, I don't know if you can type that in the chat box for us, but we built an app on a cell phone um, that the minute a congressperson sponsors or the minute the bills reintroduced the act for ALS, and this is an act that's going to help everybody with ALS get access to um, promising therapies that are in clinical trials. And kind of the, the quick summary is if it's a clial that's a by small pharma, uh, it's an up to a hundred million dollar grant fund that is gonna allow all of these clinicians that are on this call, if they've got a really promising phase three trial, they can apply to the NIH and it allows you to get access to a therapy if you didn't qualify for the clinical trial. And so it's a hundred million grant million dollars a year grant fund. And we were almost successful in getting it passed last session, very, very close to, to getting it over the hill. So we built an app that allows you to easily contact your congressperson and it allows you to just push a button and phone them or it allows you to use a pre-filled template. The really cool thing is, is once somebody sponsors, they come out of that. And so we're not gonna keep sending emails to somebody that's already sponsored the bill. 
And this was really built from my Yuri Saxena, who some of you know, um, is uh, basically down to using eye gaze and has been just a huge advocate for the community and contacting people. So we have that app and we've got a Facebook page around it. We're also um, doing a, a fundraising campaign for the Healy platform trial. For those of you that are involved in Healy, um, centered around Lou Gehrig's day and asking all of the local clinics if we can get the baseball teams to donate some of their fundraising, like from their 50-50 raffles, we can help provide more funding to the local clinics that you guys have so that you can offer expanded access to more people. Um, so this is kind of really my mission is to get drugs and bodies for those of you fighting for your lives today, but also to advocate with the FDA to help get the, 20, the 2019 guidance document actually implemented. So I'll be circling back with a couple of the clinicians on the call to, to figure out ways to do that. Um, but if you can, the Facebook page that we're kind of driving all of this off of is, a, is No More Excuses. And we're working with IMALS, Team Stevens, No More Excuses, and then the organization that we're starting called Voices for ALS and Deb's organization, Everything ALS. We all kind of work together as a team. We're the, the core group of people that are involved in the advocacy side of this. So. Um, use me as a resource. We've got templates to make it easy. And then we're working with Team Stevens, who's doing the push with Biogen right now to try to get all of the SOD1 patients earlier access than July or the fall to the Topherson um, through expanded access. So that's really my push. So if anybody's interested in getting involved with any of those, definitely reach out to me and um, we'll loop you into our process on how to make it easy to communicate and to reach out to your local media markets and then the last thing is we've got jerseys and t-shirts that we've made. Last year again, Michelle. I'm done. We okay. didn't hear about the t-shirts. So the, the t-shirts and jerseys for Lou Gehrig's Day, um, we'll, we'll launch those this week. And again, all of the funding for that will also go to Drugs and Bodies for expanded access as well. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, uh, me as a resource and I'll get you to the right people. Put your contact in the chat, please. I also wanted yeah. to say, uh, Michelle, last year when we were working on the bill, you know, we almost got there and didn't make it, but boy, for, you know, towards the end, she wasn't sleeping, contacting people, contacting congressmen. I mean, relentless, 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 hours and hours and hours. Um, I don't know if everyone knows how much time she has spent on uh, behalf of the ALS community, but as so many people here, a true hero. Thank you, Michelle, for everything you do. Uh, those were some um, exciting things to think about and move forward with for advocacy. Um, does anybody else wanna share anything specific? I know that Dr. Hyman Patterson wanted to talk about the importance of multidisciplinary care for our patients living with ALS right now and how it's um, an unfunded operation essentially. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Yeah, no, um, you know, one of the things we will be looking to include you, uh, Dr. Passanelli uh, and I and uh, Dr. Uh, Ilieva are looking at what our PAL's preferences for care. And the reason we're doing that, or one of the reasons is I want to build an informational database. I want to build a foundation to argue that um, multidisciplinary care should be reimbursed uh, at an appropriate rate uh, because most of us run at a deficit. I don't know if you realize that whatever clinic you're going to, we run at a deficit. And the reason we're able to provide multidisciplinary care is either any and all of the above occur. The university we're at donates some funds. Uh, we have a nonprofit organization that helps support us. Um, so, you know, pretty much philanthropy uh, is, is what supports our multidisciplinary clinics. And basically what we're doing, I know this is really sort of uh, direct, we're subsidizing insurance companies and they should be paying for this. And, you know, so, so we'll be uh, going maybe through everything ALS, trying to reach out to, to all PALS, PALS who are in multidisciplinary clinics and those who are not to get their care preferences. 
or to learn about care preferences. And also we'll be reaching out to our colleagues uh, to see what's the real cost of your clinic. If you didn't have any support, what would it cost to run that clinic? And what are, what are you getting from reimbursement to show that differential? What does it really cost to do a clinic visit? And, and that's really to argue that somebody, you know, insurers, Medicare needs to pick up the slack here, not, not the nonprofits. I'd much rather see our philanthropy colleagues spending that money on research to find a cure than uh, having to use the money to subsidize insurers. So I don't know. How'd that sound, Lauren? It sounded great. Um, <laughs> that's, I my, that's why. Uh, so so yeah. anybody. I would yeah. add to that. Um, as I know, you know, um, Terry, there's some preliminary data that was published by Sabrina Paganoni on the cost of ALS, of multidisciplinary ALS yes. care and, and how much of it is not um, reimbursed. And I can tell you. Um, that underestimates, by the way, Lauren. I am convinced it's an underestimate. And I don't know how Lyle feels, the other person. I would I would agree that it's an underestimate. I think it was a um, it was a very conservative um, estimate on like um, time, basically that's spent. Um, I know in our clinic, um, we definitely run at a deficit. I could tell you how much, but it's I'm, I I think I'm not, probably not supposed to. Um, and it's only um, because the university subsidizes the clinic that we're allowed to continue to exist. Um, and because we, we believe that this type of care is necessary and should occur at, uh, you know, at an academic institution, because if we're not going to do it, basically, who, who is going to do it? Um, but, um, but it's problematic. And basically, I assume I'm like everybody else. Every three years, I have to go and sing for my supper um, to make sure that my clinic continues to exist. And, you know, that's very uncomfortable. I, I have some ideas about... Um, about how insurers should pay us um, that maybe don't need to be discussed here, but um, but I think it does um, it does bear further discussion. Well, one of, um, one of my um, one of my things that that people can advocate for is is at the level of uh, Medicare and having a a facility code or a billing code for a procedure procedural code for a multidisciplinary clinic mm -hmm. that actually covers the cost and once you know. Uh, Medicare services covers it, then the other insurers would fall into place. Yeah, uh, I know that one of the problems that we have that I that I find very distressing is that because um, patients have to pay individual copays for the different services, oh. um, they often elect not to see PT or speech and language pathology because they don't want, and it's quite reasonable that they don't want to pay three copays when they come to the office. Um, and I, I think medically they would benefit from having seen. We get you know, around that by providing all of that and we pay for it. So again, somebody else is subsidizing and yeah. insurers aren't paying for what they need. So, yeah. you know. For a lot of surgery, I, I still work part time. So I have private insurance. None of my PT or any therapies are covered because I'm not improving. If yeah, go, that's the other. If, if I go on Medicare, it's covered. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge disconnect with the choice. Basically, I'm not getting the care I should be because of the cost. Yeah. You know, it's too important. There are issues with how the guidelines are set, for sure, because Sometimes disease-specific guidelines would be appropriate because you know one size does not necessarily fit all. It's another misguided, well-meaning misguided. You know, if somebody's reached maximum improvement, why should we continue to pay for PT? Well, there are diseases that you're going to want physical therapy for that aren't going to improve, but you want to maintain and you want to, and also stretching helps. You want to reduce contractures and and frozen shoulders and you know. And Lyle, we haven't heard from you on, on yeah, this so area. I, I was going to say, I think when you think about advocacy in particular, though, it's really important to think about what are the low-hanging fruit re related to something, right? Yeah. So, Terry, this particular issue you're talking about is something you and I have talked about a lot for, for quite a while. And I don't think anyone would argue with the idea that multidisciplinary 
clinics, multidisciplinary care is the standard of care for ALS, right? And there's a huge published literature that says it makes a difference and it, it really does. And, and nobody would argue that it doesn't. And it's wonderful that you guys are doing this thing to survey and to figure out what are the costs and what are the prep, you know, that's, that's not a necessarily a low hanging fruit. It's something that absolutely- That's correct. Work. But it's not a low hanging fruit, but, but no. what perhaps is a low hanging fruit that, that could get this thing rolling in the right direction is the other thing you just said, which is advocating just for a billing code for ALS multidisciplinary care, right? Because as soon as there's a billing code, I mean, maybe they're going to set it at five bucks or I don't care what they set it at, but the insurance companies are going to start looking into what are these costs? What, what does the evidence say we have to do? And that's when we can sort of argue and debate and say with them, look, you know, this reimbursement isn't enough, you need to give X amount more, or here's why, and here's what the data shows, and here's what the literature shows. But I think that the starting point and, and the thing to get others really doing that work and to get a, a mechanism is that we should just be advocating for that billing code, right? I, I actually have, Lyle. Yeah. I had meetings with CMS, and I presented all the data you're talking about, and they totally agreed with me, but it was a low, a low priority for them to, to look at this. But that's but, something that I think a patient voice could That's right. Easy. I was just going to say that. That's what, and we talked about this on our last CRLI that advocating to CMS and that that there should be a billing code for a multidisciplinary clinic, of, you know, whether you call it a procedure code or whatever you want to call it. That I mean, we can, we can argue for changing whatever that reimbursement ends up being. But, you know, right now, if I see a patient in the ALS clinic and then Laura Claussen, who, you know, is our runs our multidisciplinary care, it's a, sees that same patient on that same day, you know, um, we can't double, like the hospital says, you can't double bill for things. Yeah. Now, I don't care what I bill for, so I, because I don't care about those things. But, but the point is that I think the starting point for this is getting that billing code, right? And, and I don't think anybody could legitimately argue that multidisciplinary ALS care, number one, isn't a thing, a definable thing. And number two, isn't the standard of care. And you, know, you talked about the fact that all these foundations, look, every, multi, every large multidisciplinary you know, ALS clinic in this country has a foundation associated with it. And, and it's to help make up that, that loss. And, and it's given us this alphabet soup of foundations that are all du duplicating efforts, right? And reinventing the wheel. And, and instead, you know, it would be much great, much better if those efforts were more unified, I think. And we didn't have to have 47 or whatever, you know, different small foundations to make each one of these clinics survive. So not only no, that, can I, can I add um, from my perspective, I have a unique perspective because I've tried to, um, work outside of the big cities. And one thing uh, PALS should know very clearly is that ALS care across the country is not equal. So if you're gonna uh, raise your voice, you're uh, raising your voice not only now for the people that are you know, working with you and supporting you, but you're gonna raise your voice for each and every American that suffers from this disease because it has been so frustrating when I tried to build up a clinic from the ground in Kansas City. Kansas City has the academic institution at University of Kansas and they have a great clinic. But boy, if you try to do it yourself with your own resources at a private, very good hospital in Kansas City, you are gonna go against the wall and the wall is exactly what was just discussed. And that brings me to tell you that the um, uh, existence of this code, a bundled code that includes PTOT, yeah. speech pathology, nutrition, pulmonology care, respiratory technician, and everyone else needs to be there. Otherwise people in outside of the big cities, they don't get the care you get. So it's, it's very frustrating, it's very unfair, and you know, this needs um, to be changed. Otherwise, you know, we are going um, and spending a lot of efforts without actually, if you remember one of the things in the uh, Belmont report was justice. I mean, justice is not served across you know, serving the population in the country. So we need, we need to prove, as Terry was saying, that this is the, you know, the level of care people have to uh, receive. I mean, there's a billing code for getting sucked into a jet engine. Did you guys know that? There's a, there's a, there's a visit code that a doctor can code ICD-10. And the reason for the visit is getting sucked into a jet engine. 
So, I mean, it's just ludicrous. And, and you know, I think the messaging around getting the billing code is a, is a low hanging fruit. That's a good. Absolutely. Stuff. Lyle. Thank you. Because that, that was actually one of the things that I was, where I was going and, and you know what the pals and advocacy have the ability to make the government and CMS actually listen to us as physicians that we need this billing code, you know, um, to get insurers to come around, we need evidence because they're going to fight tooth and nail not to pay. Yeah. If you, know. you guys could um, put together, in essence, the clinicians on the call, if you could put together, in essence, a detail. I have a here. summary statement. I have, I went to CMS. I can give that to you. Yeah, I give me, if you can a, give a document me that, peer that peer, actually. We've got goes, conversations going on with the ALS caucus and we'll get it done for you. Actually, this is, a, I think, a pretty easy one to get done for you. I want to add that to the point of a uh, prior position. The state in living makes a huge difference in reimbursement. When I lived in Maryland, it cost me three times more than where I live now. So I know what CRT's law that shit in Maryland made really twice as hard and my care was three times more in Maryland hmm. as well. It should be similar price for cities versus rural. It should patients shouldn't have to decide to get care based on if they cover. So, oh, you know, I think the clinicians in this room here, we all believe that you guys deserve that care, and that's why we all take the hits at our universities for running at a deficit. And, you know, I made the joke uh, in our coffee uh, breakout that, you know, when I did a survey uh, about how do you pay for your clinic across Neal centers, um, you know, everybody 90% needed philanthropy and, and could not make ends meet without philanthropy. And, and one of my colleagues wrote, I'm so sick of being the toxic asset to my university. And that's because we all do what Lauren does. We all get grief and we have to put up with it. And we're constantly made to feel like a toxic asset, if you want to call it that, but like we're not productive, we're costing money, you know? Um, and, and so it, it's a very difficult, we fight tooth and nail to maintain the quality of care that we want to maintain. Well, so, hey, Lyle. You have my permission to tell people I was sucked into a jet engine. Yeah. All right, so there you go. Yeah. Well, actually, it kind of looks I, like it, so that's good. Whenever this comes up, it makes me, th in a couple of years ago, I spent three hours on a Friday night, in so a patient who was non-mobile, who had a, you know, a motorized wheelchair, was stuck in clinic because the wheelchair was tilted back and, and the actuator <laughs> broke, and we couldn't find anybody to service it. You know, they're 24-hour service, yeah. and so, you know, I spent like, three hours on a Friday night because we couldn't get them out of clinic. I mean, couldn't yeah. literally with manuals on the floor and a screwdriver at the Hopkins <laughs> clinic. And the yeah. job was, was, you know, and I still have this thing was that like the, the nurse practitioner who runs our clinic. She's like, she found an ICD nine code that was like disassembling the tilt actuator on a shorted out power wheelchair, but you know, something like yeah. durable. And it, and it reimbursed me $13 and 50 cents <laughs> for my Friday night. Perfect. It shows, you know, yeah. Right. It's so silly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it's just amazing, but you know we would uh, we would welcome the opportunity to work work with uh, our advocates uh, on this, and I would be happy to go and present to any caucus or anything about this. I feel very passionate about this. It's it's a legacy I want to leave my fellow clinic directors when I retire. That, that we it's made an easy thing for you guys to message around personally too, because of the I think the absolutely that you, see, that you can you know express to people about how the multidisciplinary care matters, right? But I really think the low-hanging fruit is, is get that code. And then- No, I, you're 100% you're you're right. I try, like I said, uh, but I think with, with advocates, with pals behind us, this is the power you guys have. With pals behind it, you know, any one of us could argue very cogently about why this is so critical. It's really all about providing the best care possible. So yeah, that I always, 
actually, I always say that, that when we have advocates around when we're doing the CRLIs, that's always my suggestion. Can we argue for a billing code for multidisciplinary clinic? So how about other people? What, what else are you thinking of? Uh, or what else did you get out of the, the weekend? If, you know, uh, we'd love to have you share. Like that's one great project to move forward. If we can come up with one more, I think that would be fantastic. Any thoughts? I'm sorry, could you say that again, Lauren? Oh, I was just saying that's one great project to move forward. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about another project to move forward? There was, I think, a lot of excitement surrounding the news from Biogen that they're gonna, you know, try to um, get Tofersen to people who need it earlier than they had planned. And that certainly is based on the advocacy of, um, uh, I don't wanna say a single patient, um, but certainly started by a patient. And I think that was a great demonstration um, of what a patient can do. If anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about, I'm happy to expand, but I imagine most of the people on this call do. Um, so I think there's you know, great opportunity for patients to advocate for expanded use programs, that, which is something that people are so interested in. Does anybody wanna make a comment about that? I, I'm just going to speak up for a lot of the patients that I work with. We're still furious because Biogen um, is taking a position that's delaying people for four months. And if this were a stage four cancer and somebody said, oh, you got stage four cancer, we'll help you in July, the entire country would be livid. And it's unconscionable that a company that's worth $41 billion is not helping the people who have rapidly advancing ALS today it's inhumane. And I, I know some of the doctors can't comment on that because you work with Biogen, but the people in the community are livid. Um, people like Mayuri Saxena is a one on a scale of 48. And she asked Biogen for help five times. And the reason she didn't qualify for the trial is because her clinician at an ALS center of excellence didn't give her a genetic test in time. And so by the time she got her genetic test, she was past the window of time to qualify. And she asked five times with Bob Brown, so if you're ever going to get expanded access with anybody, um, so the patient community is still livid and we are still going to be pushing Biogen and I think it's unconscionable for their position this fall. If clean and the people in the Healy trial can do it with their funding, Biogen should be able to do it. Sorry, I just, that's, that's like my, it's a burr under my saddle right now because yeah. people are praising them and they're doing something that small pharma did a long time ago and they should have done a long time ago. And they're lying to patients about it inhibiting trials and all the other things. So this is, uh, it kind of gets me in trouble with some people because I'm so vociferous about this, but um, a lot of the patients sit and cry to me at night that their lives don't matter and they've lost 34 people in their family and Biogen's not gonna help them save one more person. I think it's inhumane. Well, this is definitely a space that is, you know, we're happy to, not happy to hear your, I mean, we're, you're welcome to say whatever your thoughts are here. Um, I know there's a lot of emotion surrounding this. Um, I'm not going to argue with you. This is not a place for argument or, or even disagree with you necessarily. Um, I think this is a, an evolving situation. It's, I don't think it's totally straightforward. I, um, but does anybody else want to sort of respond to that or make a comment about that? Agree, disagree? I will make the comment that competition makes things move faster. So besides the um, anybody against SOD1, um, I read in pretty much the same within the same day that there is a micro RNA against SOD1 that's coming on the market. They, um, not on the market, but that they filed with FDA their intent to uh, start the trial. So it tells you in no uncertain ways that if in the same, pretty much within the same week, uh, Biogen starts to discuss opening up and at the same, in the same week, microRNA against SOD1 is being announced as, you know, filing an application with FDA that 
you know, besides uh, patients' efforts, anything that brings competition in that area is going to push things forward. And it's as sad as it is, I think that's the reality. We need, we need companies that, you know, challenge um, themselves. And it's probably very hard to challenge um, a Goliath like Biogen, but it needs to be done. I agree with that. And I also agree with Michelle. I don't think it's all about emotion. I think it's just the constant waiting, waiting. And now here's a time where, and, and in this conference, it's been explained to me why we have to wait on this. And it didn't make sense to me. It just, it defied logic in my mind. Um, so I just, you know, I think it's beyond emotion. It's, it's not just that. It, that seems to almost I mean, I think it's fact that the ALS community, all, all we're doing is waiting. And here's a time when we don't necessarily have to wait. And so it's, you know, um, so, um, yeah, I just want to say, I, you know, that's my feeling on it. Does anybody else want to make a comment about that or um, voice an opinion? Or am um, I going to have to? No, I'll, I'll just try. I'll just I think try you're going to have to. I think we're all uh, <laughs> kind of keeping it back. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, no, I'll just chime in and say I, I would love to see every patient with ALS on something and being carefully followed, you know, to see if it works. And I, I mentioned yesterday that I'm trying to work on this new tool that will allow people, you know, to choose their own regimen to get an idea of what their predicted slope of ALS FRSR should be and to see if they're doing better over the six months that they decide to take their regimen. <clears throat> I mean, I think that's the way that not only do we get people things that give them hope, but from a scientific standpoint, if this is a lot of different diseases and we don't yet know how to subtype them, then the next best thing we can do is high throughput drug screening and people get everybody on something and start trying to see if there are groups of responders to different treatments. And I think there's a lot of different ways to go about this, but we need to start moving in that direction. And I'm, I'm glad to see some of these efforts. I, I do think there's gonna be a lot more expanded access and we're gonna learn a lot more from people who are not in trials over the next few years, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. So Rick, let me ex expand on that a little bit or, or sort of uh, tell you something that I've been thinking about. And that's really, uh, and in collaboration with someone who does uh, iPS cells from, creates them from white, blood cells yep. and has screening compound libraries. And so combining the prediction algorithms, I've been thinking about this with, you know, you, you take somebody's cells, you throw on the library of compounds, see what, what rescues the cells. That's almost individualized medicine. But, but what I've been wrestling with is how do I know if there's been an effect? If I take that person and I then treat them with the compound that rescued their cells in a Petri dish, is it adequate to use a prediction paradigm? It, you know, this is what's holding me back uh, on implementing this is, is just, you know, and these are a library of compounds that are available, you know, off the shelf. Yep. So, so you know. Yeah, I mean, what, what I would say, Terry, is that it's never gonna be perfect because the progression of ALS is not linear. No. And you know, we published that paper a few years ago and we showed that people can have plateaus and they can have small reversals. They're not that uncommon. But I feel like, you know, we have to start somewhere. And to me, you know, if you have somebody who's expected to progress at a certain rate and there's no progression at all over a six month period of time, let's call it a responder and let's see if we can find anybody else who responds to that regimen. We got to start somewhere. It's not perfect, but I feel like that's a good starting place. Rick, I, I, I totally, I, I totally agree with you. I think that the question, and I think that all of us here in this group agree. The question is, how can we find that algorithm uh, that Terry was talking about to convince the FDA? Because at this point, the roadblock, yeah. right, yeah. is really the FDA to give approval for such a. Uh, trials that you were you are talking about 
Yeah, well, you, you they don't have to approve your get, trial. I don't think this that's... is personalized medicine, actually, actually Piera. You're going to use compounds that are already available. But the issue is, how do you convince anyone that it really, that this sort of brand of personalized medicine actually is working? I don't, I don't know if I, Stop you know, progression. I N1. No, yeah, Stop but, progression. No, no, that's, that's the bar. <laughs> Our status. No, I mean, this is, this something, is something that the field struggles with is how to define a responder. And I would say we define it by a, a progression of zero or a positive, an improvement. It's a very high bar. That is a high bar. Somewhere. And, and that's, that's what I'm looking for in my patients. Sure. Just about every one of my 450 patients is experimenting with something. And that's what we decide. We say, what are we going to look for? And what we usually agree to is we're going to look over the next six months if we stop progression or if you start to recover loss function. And if you don't, then we're going to keep changing your regimen and trying to find that. I mean, I feel like that's the definition of a responder that I'm interested in. That's um, that. Eric, can, can Eric, it looks like you had something to say. Can you sure. I'm just trying to butt in? That's fine. A couple of, so I, I agree with Rick that, that, uh, that although there are some reversals that, it kept, that appear to happen by natural history, that's such a rare event that that's a, a threshold. It's like giving someone penicillin who has pneumonia you don't have to do a big randomized blinded controlled study to discover that antibiotics are a curative, potentially curative therapy. And so that can work in that situation. Unfortunately, most of the interventions we're studying don't have that dramatic an effect. And yet we would still like to identify those that have provide some benefit. The mechanism that we've taken, I've seen used in what was a, a not a successful trial, but the, the approach I was, thought was very attractive was uh, taking uh, stem cells, culturing stem cells from each participant, generating neurons from those, using those then in a Petri plate to try, just as you're saying, uh, Terry, to, to profile a panel of interventions. In this case, we we're looking at uh, retigabine. Um, and so we had data on each person and their clinical response to retigabine. And we had their in vitro response. And that then is a data set that could be, you know, that's sort of an approach where you can evaluate is what I'm learning from in vitro assays informative about the potential efficacy of that yeah. intervention in the person. We just aren't doing enough of that yet. Uh, it's a little more expensive as a different direction, but uh, it's a different, it's a, it's a biomarker that would be very predictive um, of your uh, future course and might allow for that individualized treatment in the future. Yeah, well, that's what I, I mean, I think you're describing, but is that enough to do it that way? I mean, and, and what that am I, do right? I do a lead in? Do I, you know, so we could talk offline about this, but it's been something for about three months now. I've been trying to come up with a protocol because yeah. I'd like to sort of pilot an individualized medicine program and, and, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, I'd be happy to think with you about a, a design that would help provide support for them. I'm, Go ahead, Lyle. Yeah, no, I'm curious to hear from actually the other clinicians that are on this Zoom, what you guys think of the roads? Because I think, you know, a lot of the issues that we're discussing yeah. right now have to do with the fact that our outcome measures stink and, you know, and, and what is progression, right? And, and we measure the slope of a slope of a change of a slope and, you know, and oh, and look, that changed, right? And, and math teachers' heads would explode if they saw us doing that like the derivative of a derivative. And, you know, but I think that this new, this rash built scale, like they have been very successful in other yeah. neurological disorders, mm -hmm. you know, in, in things like um, immune mediated demyelinating neuropathies in dementias, these, these rash built ordinal scales seem to be good. And we have a new one in ALS. And, you know, um, I'm just curious what others opinions are. Have, have you tried it out? Are you using it? Do you intend to use it? Rick, is it something you would build into this app? You know, what do you think of it? I love it, Lyle. I mean, I was one of the authors on the paper. So yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, I, I love it. I, there's absolutely a need for a better outcome measure for our clinical trials, especially if we're going to keep doing them the way that we've been doing them, which is, you know, uh, to look for a very small effect and a very noisy disease. There's not enough information right now to do what I'm talking about doing with my N of one studies. I mean, we would need to have a database of people. You don't who know what the prediction is. Until we yeah. 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 So for You're now, right. I have to use the ALS FRSR because that's what the patients like me community has 10,000 patients, you know, in many cases with years of serial ALS FRSR scores. 
that I can use to generate my prediction algorithm. Someday, I hope we have that for the roads because I think it will be more yeah. accurate. Yeah, I would, um, I would second that. I would like to see the roads adopted um, broadly and I think we should start using it yesterday, personally. Yeah. So, so the reason I asked that, that was a loaded question. So two things. So one is the reason I was asking was because again, just thinking about low hanging fruit, I think that is right now an opportunity for maybe adoption broadly of an easy to use outcome measure. That's the kind of thing that that you know actually patients can self administer, that our clinics can do, that's available freely on a website, and and is the kind of thing that down the road might solve some of these issues. And so I don't know if there's an interest in that, but you know, advocating for the adoption of that scale. I don't know if you know, Rick, where that the initial seed came from, but like I don't know, was it like eight years ago? We were at a bar after a meeting about postmortem tissue banking, and Christina and I and a couple others were talking about how much we love the rods for CIDP for this other disease, and we're like, shit, we need a rods for ALS. This was maybe like ten years ago, and you know, um, so I'm. Can you tell us a little bit this. about it? What's that? Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, so um, I can point you, I don't want to, we don't have time, I don't think right now, but I can send you some emails about it. How about that, that you can read that are easy. Is that, um, uh, you know, it's a way of designing these scales to talk about how severe a disease is, where uh, a one point difference in, in your score means the same thing, whether you have a severe disease or a mild disease. And it's a list of questions and you basically have to answer the questions. Yes, I can do this. Um, I can do this, but with some difficulty or no, I can't do this. And that's like a, you know, a zero, one, two point for that question. There's a mathematical way that these questions are generated to be such a way that whether you have a high score or a low score, a change in a certain amount has the same meaning. And it's been very successful in other diseases. You know, and I would love to see advocates say, hey, this is something I can do on my own. This is something I'd love my neurologist in the middle of nowhere to adopt because it's actually kind of easy. I don't know. So could two, two quick questions, could we build a simple app that would allow that, that you guys could all use? I would think because so. Yes. Deb's got everything ALS and Indu yeah. and Indu's tech, that's her world. I mean, it certainly would be I mean, easier than the ALS FRS are. And you know, I'll defer to Rick who's involved with the studies and, and but uh, we can send you the link. I mean, you can download the thing from the Emory website right now, right? So you can just, yeah, it's easy. Yeah, I mean, it's free open source. Anybody can use it, so. Yeah. yeah. I would, I would think that, that that would be amenable to an app because there's nothing very complicated about it. Um, we can talk to Christina Fournier about it since um, she's sort of the, I know yeah. she didn't patent it or trademark it or anything, but she's sort of the owner of the scale. I don't wanna say owner, but it's her baby. Yeah. Um, so um, we could talk to her about it, but I think that's a terrific idea. Um, I think this discussion has been fantastic. It's just about noon. And um, we don't want to go over time because everyone's been really um, fantastic to participate. And I just want to say thank you again to Terry for organizing this. I think it's been great. Just to summarize from this session, um, it looks like as um, Lyle was attributing, um, was um, um, directing us towards low hanging fruit. Um, we should definitely aim for the low hanging fruit. So maybe getting a CMS code. Um, and working towards that, it would be a really, really great um, thing to do. And then, oh, he's, he continues to put things in the chat about the roads, um, which again was um, um, championed by Christina Fournier at Emory, who is a, a really fantastic um, clinician and ALS um, um, uh, data. A member of our ALSRP programmatic panel too, so oh, happy to wonderful. have her. Something. Yeah, so um, she's absolutely fantastic. And um, I'm sure that if we talk to her, she would be um, happy to um, work with us on getting this out uh, more broadly to the entire population. So thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your weekend. And um, maybe I'll just um, turn it over to Terry really, really quickly so that she can tell everybody how to officially sign up as research ambassador. Yeah, well, okay. Uh, well, actually what I wanna do is Without the pals who are here, this wouldn't have been possible. Thank you so much for attending. I hope that you got something out of uh, the last two days and that, that you know, you'll find your niche for, for advocacy. And I, I have to thank the faculty, although I know we all feel like uh, this was no chore. This was really, uh, you know, we got more out of it than, than we gave, We just being here. And so I, I wanna, tell you how much I appreciate your, your being here and, and helping me to, to do this.
And Rick, thank you for developing this program. I think it's a great program, you know, I have from day one. And we have some good ideas. Sarah will be sending around links and information uh, about how to sign up uh, as an advocate. She'll be sending you your certificates and also putting together a contact list so those of us who want to contact each other uh, can um, get together. If there's anyone who doesn't want to be contacted for whatever reason, uh, we get it. Just let Sarah know that you don't want to be on the list, please. And that includes faculty also, because I think sometimes uh, our pals will want to reach out to some of us as, as faculty as well. So if, if you know, there's a, a reason, and there are many reasons I can think of. Um, so uh, again, thank you all. And thank you to my team at the, at the foundation, uh, you know, for, for all the hard work you put in to make this, make this work. Noah, Mary, uh, uh, Jamie, Sarah, and Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, everybody have a great day and uh, let us know, fill out the assessment forms. Let us know what you thought worked and what you thought didn't work. We appreciate that. And if you missed any parts of it, we're recording it. It will be up on our website, on YouTube channel and so forth. So thanks again, appreciate it. Thank you so much, it was amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, everyone.